Hello, my name is Andrew Spires, and today I'm going to be talking about progress on second order self forcing curve for Emory models. Uh, this work I have completed with my supervisor Adam Pound and collaborator Jordan Watson. So, a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to discuss why we need second order self force, and then I'm going to explain how we can extend first order methods in Kerr, so the Tchaikovsky equation to second order. Then I'm going to discuss gauge invariance as second order and why you need gauge fixing, and also what gauges you want to fix to for Emery's. So, what is gravitational self force? Basically, you can think of it as perturbation theory for Emery's. So, in this diagram, it depicts the space-time where a supermassive black hole causes the curvature, but also there is a compact object orbiting the supermassive black hole. And due to the self-force, this orbit slowly evolves closer and closer towards the supermassive black hole until the compact object eventually plunges into the supermassive black hole horizon. So to describe this space-time, we expand the metric in terms of the small mass ratio, epsilon, where the small m is the compact, mod compact object mass and the capital M is the supermassive black hole mass. So for an Emery, as supermassive black holes are expected to be spinning, the background metric G0 is taken to be the Kerr metric. And the self-force problem boils down to trying to calculate the metric perturbations h1 and h2. From the metric perturbations, you can calculate the self-force to first and second order, f1 and f2. And this tells you how the compact object is accelerating. And from that, you can um, model the in spiral. So in this talk, I'm going to be talking about how you can calculate the second order self force F2. And so in context with the LISA symposium, um, the second order self force is required for precise parameter extraction from Emory signals in the LISA data. So this will allow you to do groundbreaking tests on general relativity. So currently, second order is in its infancy stage in terms of calculations. But recently, uh, quasi-circular orbits in Schwarzschild have been uh, modelled. Uh, they have modelled the self-force in this arrangement. But this method um, uses the fact that in Schwarzschild, in the Lorentz gauge, the Einstein field equations are separable. However, in Kerr, the Einstein field equations are non-separable in the Lorentz gauge. So we're going to need a new method. In order to find a new method, let's return to first order self-force for inspiration on how to calculate the second order self-force. So a quick note on notation. I'm going to absorb the epsilon dependency into the tensors, so the superscript in curly brackets. Um, that denotes uh, the proportionality to epsilon. And I'm going to talk a lot about the Weyl scalar psi 4, which is a vacuum curvature scalar. So basically what you need to know about this is it contains the information about the gravitational waves being emitted by the system. And then we're going to take an expansion of psi 4 in terms of epsilon like this. So at first order, we solve for psi 4 1, using the Tchaikovsky equation, where O is a second order differential operator. And on the right hand side, you have a source term, which is a linear operator S sourced by the first order perturbation to the stress energy tensor. Now, usefully, this equation is separable, unlike the linear Einstein field equations in Kerr. So it's much easier to solve numerically. Once you calculate psi for one, you can obtain the metric perturbation H1 by using CCK metric reconstruction. And then from H1, you can calculate the first order self-force. So we want to extend these methods 
to second order such that we can calculate the dissipative piece of the second order self force. Okay, so the second order Tchaikovsky equation has actually been around for a while, for over 20 years. Uh, derived by Campanelli and Lusto in this form is similar to the Tchaikovsky equation, except for it's acting on psi 4 2 now, the second order perturbation to psi 4. And this results in an additional source term sourced by the first order metric perturbation. However, when you try and apply this equation to the gravitational self force problem, it appears to be non integrable. And that's due to the highly singular nature of the source. So near the world line, the metric perturbation is singular, where r is distance from the world line, and this is due to the presence of the compact object, which makes the source very singular, r to the minus 6. When you try and integrate this term, you find you get an undefined answer. When you put r equals 0 in here, it's ill-defined. So this motivated us to try and find a new second order Tchaikovsky equation with a source which is well defined as a distribution. To derive this equation, we're going to use the world identity. So here is just a quick note that the world identity simply falls out from the Tchaikovsky equation. So once when you defined an operator T such that it gives you psi for one um, for h1. Then you can rewrite it into this familiar OT equals SE form using the linearized Einstein equation. So if we act OT equals SC on h2 rather than h1, then we get another second order Tchaikovsky equation. Except for this time, it's a little bit different because the operator O is acting on th2, which we call psi 4 l2, and this results in the source being different. And uh, this term here arises from the quadratic, this is the quadratic Einstein tensor, and it arises from the second order linearized Einstein equation. Now, usefully, there's only one operator acting on these two source terms, which we'll use later. Um, but first, what is psi 4 l2? Now this actually came up in Campanelli and Lusto, and they talked about how psi 4 2 is made up of a linear in H2 piece and a quadratic in H1 piece. And psi 4 L2 is simply the linear in H2 piece. Now usefully, um, at leading order, at future null infinity, psi 4 L2 is the same as psi 4 2, and this means it contains the same information about the gravity rotational waves being emitted from the system. So we think from that you can derive the dissipated piece of the second order self force. And unlike psi 4 2, psi 4 L2 has the useful property of being infinitesimal tetrad rotation invariant. And this is akin to local Lorentz invariants and is useful for comparing results. So we have a new second order Tchaikovsky equation, but is its source regular? So you'll see here that the source is still highly singular near the world line. However, we can use the fact that in a highly regular gauge, D2G and the second order um, stress energy tensor are well defined as, as distributions. Therefore, as S is a linear operator, we can use distribution theory to tell us that S acting on these quantities gives you a well defined distribution, which means we believe the equation is integrable. So now I would like to turn our attention to another problem with second order calculations and that is to do with gauge invariance. So at first order life is made easy due to psi 4 1 which you solve the Tchaikovsky equation for being gauge invariant. And you see here with the gauge invariant equation in the new gauge is the same as in the old gauge. And this is because in Kerr, um, you can make the zeroth order, the background psi 4, zero. However, this quality doesn't hold at second order due to the second order gauge transformation being a lot more complicated. An additional term survives 
and this makes Psi42 not gauge invariant. However, it is more simple, it has a more simple gauge transformation equation than a generic second order tensor, as it only depends on C1, the first order gauge vector. And it's a similar story for Psi4 L2, and we're going to use this fact that it's only dependent on C1 in order to implement a gauge fixing technique. So that means we're going to write Z1 in terms of the first order metric perturbation, such that Z1 takes you to a fully fixed gauge from any gauge which H1 is in. Campanelli and Lusto also discussed this and um, gave a method for, for calculating a gauge vector, which involved solving PDEs. But today I want to talk about um, what gauges you want to fix to in the Emory problem. Um, so here we have a Penrose diagram depicting an emery as the compact object on this world line gamma falls into the supermassive black hole whose horizon is H+. And we've discussed already how near the world line we need to use a highly regular gauge to make our Tchaikovsky equation um, integrable. And um, so you want to fix to the highly regular gauge there, but also as the compact object in spirals, it emits gravitational waves away from the system to asymptotic null infinity. So you want to have an asymptotically flat gauge in this region so that you can analyze the gravitational waves being emitted there. And similarly, gravitational waves are also emitted into the supermassive black hole horizon. So you want a horizon regular gauge there. Now today I'm gonna to give a technique on how to transform to an asymptotically flat gauge at Scry plus. So that the specific gauge we're going to fix to is the bondi sachs gauge. And that is where space-time is built out of null cones of constant retarded time u, and where the null geodesics within the cone have constant angular uh, components. So you can um, Imagine space-time as being a series of null cones. And this gauge was built in order to analyze gravitational radiation. So it's a convenient gauge to use. And these are the corresponding gauge conditions. So to transform to this gauge, we produce this method where we solve the gauge transformation equation for C1 such that in the new gauge, H prime, H is H prime is in the bondi sachs gauge. It satisfies the bondi sachs gauge conditions. And we showed that this reduces to a hierarchical set of ODEs, which you integrate backwards from scribe plus along null rays. However, once you're in the bondi sachs gauge, there is some residual gauge freedom. This is uh, known as the BMS group. So we've also found a method for algebraically solving a uh, gauge vector such that you can fix the BMS frame of the space-time. And you do this by placing further constraints on the metric perturbation. So implementing these two methods, you can gauge fix our second order Tchaikovsky equation such that it solves for a gauge invariant result, psi for L2 prime. So in summary, today I've discussed a new form of the second order Tchaikovsky equation whose source we can make regular in the highly regular gauge. I've discussed our plan for gauge fixing this Tchaikovsky equation uh, in three physically significant regions for emery's in good gauges and given a practical method for fixing to a good gauge at Scry plus the bondi sachs gauge and also fixing the residual freedom the BMS frame. Thank you very much for listening I'll be happy to hear any questions and also please feel free to contact me and look out for our forthcoming paper. Thank you very much.